Maggie and I are delighted to be with you tonight. We are appreciative of the invitation to come, and certainly we jumped at the opportunity. We just closed a lectureship at Gutwell this last Wednesday evening, and we had 28 speakers from Sunday morning to Wednesday night, and I introduced all of them, and I heard all of them. And I'm worn out, just to tell you the truth. It's wonderful to hear the truth and hear the gospel proclaimed, but it's also somewhat tiring, isn't it? But we appreciate your interest and your appreciation for the gospel of Christ. We have many good friends in this audience tonight. I'd like to mention every one of them, but I'd be sure to leave out one of them, and that would get me in more trouble than what I'm in now. But at any rate, it's a pleasure to be here. We thank you for the invitation, and we certainly are happy that we and be a part of this great lectureship program, the third annual Lawrence Randolph County's Bible Lectureship. Brother DeMint has been very gracious to help me out. Every time I think of Portia, Arkansas, I think of L.N. Moody and Mildred Moody, and I think of Brother Foy Wallace, Jr., and his good wife, and those were great giants, and I know that you appreciated them, too, here in Portia. They loved the truth. They loved the church. They were willing to stand. And, of course, that's what we need all gospel preachers to do. And I believe we have some gospel preachers in this area who are doing exactly that. Congratulations, and we're thankful for you. Tonight we discuss the subject, is the Church of Christ, or why the Church of Christ is not a denomination. That, of course, suggests something already affirmed, that the Church of Christ is not a denomination. Many people will not agree with that. <clears throat> Most people would say, listen, the Church of Christ, just like all other churches, are denominational. But my friends, they're not. And we don't want to harm you in feelings or anything like that, but we're going to speak straight tonight. And we're going to do so characteristic of that which is revealed in the Bible. The Bible, of course, gives the answers to everything. And whether I agree with it or not doesn't change the Bible. It doesn't change it at all. The fact of the matter is, it even makes it more simple when I realize that what the Bible said is true and cannot be wrong. Of course, some would say, I am a church of Christ. Uh, no, you're not. Or I am a preacher, I am a church of Christ preacher. A man told me this evening at supper time. Well, here's three church of Christ preachers. No, you're not a church of Christ preacher. That's denominationalizing the name. And so we need to think along those lines and we need to be sure that we do not join the denominations if we don't intend to be a denomination. Indeed, it is important that we do not use denominational terms. I'm afraid we're raising or have raised a generation of young people who do not realize that the Church of Christ is not a denomination. And because of that, we're going to have to go back to work, and we're going to have to make it clear, and we're going to have to show why that's true. And indeed, it should be that which we all ought to desire to do. Larger congregations, even of the Churches of Christ now, are sometimes claiming to be just another denomination. But they're not the Church of Christ if they are. My friends, the Church of Christ is a distinctive thought, isn't it? It is an exclusive thought. And if you blame me tonight with being exclusive and being one who is narrow and exclusive in my preaching, you're right, I am. Because it is true. The church that Jesus established is not like any church that anybody else has ever had. Amen. And you know what? I noticed the other day a statistic that said 33,000 different religions in our world today. 33,000. How many did the Lord build? One. All right. He said, upon this rock I will build my church. Not churches. My church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 18. To the apostles he said, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Loosed upon earth shall be loosed in heaven. I know that those are familiar passages to you. And I know that each of us appreciate what the Bible says. Because it's right. And it cannot be wrong. When we turn back to the Old Testament, we do not find the church mentioned in the patriarchal age. Oh, I know there's some who say, yes, the church was established way back in the patriarchal age. No, it wasn't. When we come through the law of Moses, we don't find the term church even used. And it's not there. It wasn't established during the law of Moses. No, for those 1,500 years, it wasn't established. For the 2,500 years of the patriarchal dispensation, it wasn't established. And until we come to Matthew 16, 18, we don't even find that word. 
But in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus first of all uses that term. He said, upon this rock I will build my church. And what that term is in the original language is ecclesia. You know that, which means the called out. And it's not talking about those of the world, no. These are those who are called out of the world. And they're sanctified. No, you don't have to die to be sanctified in Christ Jesus. You have to be alive, really. Uh, but to be sanctified, it does not mean that you're completely holy. But it does mean that you're separated from the world to serve the Lord. And he has a special place for you, a special obligation for you, a special work for you. You are to be sanctified. In John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Well, if we're sanctified then, we realize that we are set apart in a narrow, exclusive sense. And I'm not trying to say that to be ugly, but you know those who think I'm pompous, they're wrong. Because that's what the Bible teaches. And I'm going to teach what the Bible teaches. In Psalms 119, verse 172, there he said, All of thy commandments are righteousness. Well, when I realized that, then I realized that all of the commandments of God are righteousness. If we want to be righteous, we've got to do the commandments of God. 1 John 5 says, He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Then I find in Matthew 5, 20, Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, I know some of you misused that verse, I think, to teach that we ought to give more than they gave under the Jewish economy. That's not what that verse is teaching. This verse is talking about entering the kingdom. And our righteous plan has to be greater than their righteous plan or we can't enter the kingdom. Their righteous plan, of course, demanded perfection. We don't have any perfection. They didn't either. But we have forgiveness under the righteousness of Christ. And when he died, suffered on the cross for our sins, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who would obey him. Hebrews 5, 9. Righteousness is important. All his commandments are righteousness. Our righteousness has to exceed their righteousness. Or else we can't even enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, when I turn to Romans 1, verse 16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation unto everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also unto the Greek, for therein is revealed the righteousness of God. From faith unto faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now question, does that mean that God is a righteous being? Well, he is, there's no doubt about that, but that's not what that verse is teaching. No, no, therein is revealed the righteous plan of God to make us righteous. In the gospel, the gospel is God's power to do what? To save. And therein is revealed the righteousness of God. From faith unto faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Your righteousness is going to have to be in harmony with the gospel. You're going to have to hear it because you wouldn't know it any other way. You're going to have to believe it with all of your heart. You're going to have to repent of your sins and confess the name of Christ that he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And you're going to have to go with him into the waters of baptism to wash away your sins. Well, in, John, in the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, verse 1 through 3, Paul said, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. I bear them record they have a zeal of God, but watch it. It's not according to knowledge. And they being ignorant of God's righteousness. And having gone about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. All right. We have to exceed the righteousness which they had. It's found revealed in the gospel. And except we obey that, we cannot be saved. In Jeremiah 10, 23, he said, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In John 17, 20, 21, he said, Neither for these only do I pray, but for them also that shall believe on me through their word, that they may be one, Father, as thou art in me and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. Well, we notice furthermore in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, enter ye in at the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many are they that enter in thereat, but narrow is the way, the gate, narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Question. If you leave the narrow way, where are you? <laughs> Since there are only two ways to walk, you've got to be in the broad way. And one who claims, I don't have, you don't have to be a member of my church to be saved. Well, you're in the broad way then, friend. 
Because you have to be in the narrow way to go to heaven and to be saved, and that's the Lord's way. That's too simple to miss, isn't it? Well, I read further. When I read in Matthew 7, 21 through 27, not everyone, Jesus said, that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in thy name? In thy name cast out demons. In thy name do many wonderful works. But then he said, I'll profess unto them, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I don't know you. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and upon earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've taught you. And lo, I'll be with you always, even unto the end of the world. In Mark the 16th chapter, verse 15 and 16, he said, Now go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why? Because therein is revealed the righteousness of God, the plan by which you can become righteous. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, friend, that's, that's black and white, isn't it? In Luke 24, verse 46, 47, he said, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And then I read further in 1 Timothy 3, verse 14 and 15, uh, Timothy, these things I write unto thee, hoping to come to thee shortly, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. What important lessons we have in these few verses, don't we? In 1 Timothy 4, 16, he said, Now take heed to yourself and to your teaching, continue in these things, for in doing this thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee. And then again in Galatians 1, 6 through 9, Paul said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that calls you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that troubled you and would pervert, twist, change the gospel of Christ. But though we, he said, or even an angel from heaven come down and preach some other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And as I said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel to you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. Do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men if I yet please men? I should not be the servant of Jesus Christ. In 2 John 9 through 11, he said, Now whosoever, that's a universal term, isn't it? Whosoever goeth onward or goes beyond, you know some people talk about being progressive. That's what this means, to be progressive. Whosoever goeth onward or is progressive and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. But he that abideth in the doctrine he hath both the Father and the Son, and if any man come unto you and bring not this doctrine, do not invite him into your house, neither bid him God speed, for he that bid him God speed is partaker of his evil deed. Well, in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10 through 12, he said, Brethren, I beseech you, in the name or by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together of the same mind and of the same judgment. Now he said, it's been signified unto me concerning, or from the household of Chloe concerning you, that there are contentions among you. And this I mean that one of you saith, I am of Paul, or I am of Paul, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. He said, a Christ divided. <laughs> Have you answered that question? You need to. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? You need to answer that question. No, he said, I thank God that I baptized none of you, say Christmas and yes, lest you should say that you were baptized in my name. You know, division is a sin. Denominationalism is a sin. I'm not saying that to hurt your feelings. I'm saying that because that's what the Bible teaches. It is a sin to do that. 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but prove the spirits, whether they be of God, for many false prophets are gone out into the world. And then again, 1 Timothy 4, and verse 1, he said, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats. He said they've been seared, as it were, with a hot iron in their conscience. And in other words, they don't have any feeling left for truth. You know, if you have a cow and you have a brand on that cow, 
You can put a pin in that brand anywhere you want to and he won't flinch. But you get outside that brand, he's going to jump because that's still sensitive. Now, if these are branded in their consciences with a hot iron, they don't have any sensitivity uh, in that brand. You can, you can say all you want to about it. It doesn't matter to them. It doesn't matter to them. They say, my catechism is all right no matter what you say. My creed book is okay no matter what you say. The Book of Mormon is bound to be all right, even though the Bible says, don't you add to these things or take away from them. Or God's going to add the plagues that are written in this book and he's going to remove your name out of the tree of life and out of the holy city, which are written in this book, Revelation 22, 18 and 19. Hebrews 2 then says in chapter 1, or chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we let them drift away from us. For if the words spoken by angels were steadfast, that's the old law, and every transgression and every disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How are we going to escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, both with signs and wonders and manifold deeds and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will? Well, I'm not surprised then in Ephesians 1.22 that he said, God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to be uh, the heavenly head of the church, while well, we have an earthly head over in Rome who says he is Lord God the Pope. You know what's wrong with that? It's just not so. There is no earthly head. Christ is the only head. Now listen to it again. He put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Wives, be subject to your husbands, Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for it, not them, but it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water with the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Now that spot or wrinkle is a name that he didn't give, a worship that he didn't ordain. An organization that he didn't make. Now, is the religious organization that you're a member of, can you find it in the Bible? Can you find the worship service in the Bible? Can you find the five items of worship? Or have you added maybe two more? Or have you subtracted some? That wouldn't be the Lord's church then. Not only that, but what about the organizational structure? Do you have pastor or pastors? Do you have elder or elders? You know, it's always plural in the New Testament, never singular. Can't just have one pastor. Can't just have one elder. Got to have all, or at least two or more. And so these things you see identify the Lord's church, and he doesn't want it to have spot or blemish like that. He doesn't want it at all. He wants it to be pure and holy, in harmony with his will, in other words. So to change the church of Christ in name or in practice or in system of salvation or in worship, is to change the gospel of hope. If not, why not? If you change these things, my friends, you've changed from the Lord and you can't expect him to bless you since he said he is the way, the truth, the life, and no man cometh unto the Father in another way. John 14, 6. When you talk about counterfeits, those that are kind of like it but not really it, that's a counterfeit. And do you know they have no value in the bank of heaven? It's not because I don't want them to, but it's because the Lord has said it won't work. You cannot do it. In Matthew 15, the disciples said, Lord, don't you know the Pharisees were offended at thy doctrine? He said, let them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. He said, now, every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. He didn't say be cut off at the top. He said he's going to dig it out. And Hebrews 12, 28, 29 says, Having received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace whereby we may offer service well pleasing unto God with reverence and with awe. Watch it, for our God is a consuming fire. And he's going to burn up the shaft. We don't want to take a chance on not finding him pleased with us when he comes back. Now the Bible teaches there's one vine, John 15. It teaches there's one vineyard, Matthew 20. It teaches there's one kingdom, Matthew 16, 19. 
It teaches us one fold or flock, John 10, 16. It teaches us one family, 1 John 3, 1. It teaches that there is one body, Ephesians 4 and verse 4. It teaches that there's one church. Now, if it teaches that, can I say, well, I don't care what it teaches. I know what I want to believe. I know what I want to do. And if the church of Christ is not a denomination, I want to be a part of a denomination. Well, then you want to be a part of something in a broad way. And it will not allow you, my friend, to go to heaven. You see, a denomination is a part of something. A denomination of a dollar is a quarter, or a nickel, or a dime, or a penny. Those are all denominations of a dollar. Now, that's a part of that, but it's not the completeness of it. If I have a dime, I can't say, well, I have a dollar. Because I don't. I only have a dime. And the same is true, my friends, of the denomination. Man didn't create the church of Christ. God did. Man's teaching won't make the church of Christ, but the teaching of God will. And the New Testament church is unique. It is the body of believers. It is sanctified, set apart to the Lord's service. And it is that which at all times must be the completeness of Christ's religion. You know, that word religion is interesting. It's not found but five times in the text. But it always means a system of faith and practice. What is your religion? It means what is your system of faith and practice? If you have a system of faith and practice that meets the Lord's criterion, wonderful, you're going to heaven. You're on your way to that beautiful city we just sang about a few moments ago. But if you don't follow his teaching, friend, you can't have that hope. You see, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11. 1. Now, to say that faith is the substance, it means two Latin words, sub and stance, it stands under. So here is faith that stands under our hope. What if you don't have any faith? You don't have any hope. And faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So if you don't listen to the word of God, you don't have faith, which is built on evidence. And if you don't have the faith that's built on evidence, you don't have the hope. Hope is expectation with desire. Two ingredients always in hope. Expectation with desire. You may expect something you don't desire. And you may desire something you don't expect. But when you have expectation with desire, then you have hope. And indeed, we have hope in Christ because we have his word. And his word can't fail. His word will always be right. And the New Testament church is referred to in nine ways in the text. It's referred to as the church. It's referred to as the church of Christ, as the body of Christ, of the church of the Lord, of the church of the firstborn, of the temple of God, of the bride of Christ, of the kingdom of God, of the house of God. Now, do you find your religious organization in any of those names? If you don't, why would you be a part of it? I don't intend to be a part of something I cannot read one word about in the word of God. I just don't intend to because I know that won't save. We're called brethren. We're called disciples. We're called believers. And Paul said, if any, or Peter said, if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. And so we're called Christians, we're called saints, we're called children of God, we're called Christians. Is that what you say when someone says, what are you religiously? Do you say, I'm a Christian? That's what you ought to say. And of course, that's the way that we ought to live. Because if the name of your religious organization our individual members are not called by those things which the Bible teaches, then my friends, they're not scriptural. And you disobey 1 Peter 4, 11, which says, If any man speak, let him speak as it were the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him minister as of the strength which God supplieth, that in all things God may be glorified. You see, all of these refer to the same group of people. Now, if you had been present on Pentecost, and you had just known that Jesus had died on the cross, cruelly. They had spat upon him. They had pulled his whiskers out. They had slapped him and stood back and said, guess who slapped you? They put a crown of thorns on his head. They nailed big nails in his hands and in his feet. And then while he was on that cross, under the mortal agony, they stabbed him in the side. The water and the blood flowed out. My friends, if that doesn't break your heart, let me say this to you. You wouldn't be a worth a dime to the Lord's church. It is necessary for us to see the death and the suffering of our Lord 
in order to say, you know, his church is my hope. His church is the right way. I have to believe what the Bible says. It says there's one church. Now, if it says there's one church and you're not acquainted with the Bible, then you may refuse to identify the Bible as being that which teaches the one church that Jesus built. Which church should I join? You know, a lot of people in the world have that problem. They say, now, which church should I join? Well, my friends, uh, I know there's probably some good people in any of them, most of them. But uh, if you join a church, why would you just join one? Why don't you join two or three? You know, if one is good, why aren't two and three better? And, and if I was going to get into the church joining business, I'd just join them all. Because I could probably find a little good in each one of them. But you know what? Every time I talk to those people, they say, you don't have to be a member of our church to be saved. Oh, I don't? Well, why would I want to be a member of it then? I want to go to heaven. I want to be saved at last. I know people do join several clubs. They, they join several lodges sometimes. They join and, and buy insurance from different companies. They have more than one. They just join them all. And I want to say something to you. I've never joined any church. And I don't intend to. And you might say, well, I don't know why I came to hear you preach tonight if you never joined any church. But I didn't, friend. I never have joined any church. I am a member of the Collie family. I have been for several years now. And I didn't join that family. When I was born, my father didn't say, now, Gary, which family would you like to join? Oh, no, no. When I was born, I was a colleague. I didn't have any choice, and you don't either. When it comes to the Lord's church, you don't join it. You can't join it. It's impossible to join it. But you can be added to it. When Nicodemus came to Jesus, he came by night. He said, I don't know about the kingdom. Evidently, this is what he said, because Jesus said, Now, Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, Nicodemus was a Jew. He didn't know anything but Jewish birth, which was physical birth. He thought it must be a physical birth that he's talking about. And he said, how can a man enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Well, he said, Nicodemus, it's not that. Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh, I see. Here's the spirit and the water. Yes. And so 1 Corinthians 12 comes in handy right here when he says, by one spirit were we all baptized into one body. Say, that's revealing, isn't it? And that body, what is that body? Why, it's the church. Now, I ask you what church, church you would have joined had you been there on Pentecost. Well, let me tell you, friend, you couldn't have been a, a member of any but one because there wasn't but one. And you know what? Tonight, there's not either. There's not but one church the Lord purchased with his blood, one church that he built with his teaching. Mm -mm. You can't find him building another anywhere. Well, I know that sometimes premillennialism says, well, actually the kingdom and the church are not the same. You see, the Lord came to establish the kingdom, but he failed because of the Jews' objections, and so he just established the church. Well, is that right? Well, they think the church is future then, don't they? It's not. Let me say this to you, and I want you never to forget it. After Pentecost, there is never a single promise, prediction, or anything indicating that the church is future. Did you know it? After Pentecost. Now, up until Pentecost, we find all of those promises, all of those declarations of truth, and yet at Pentecost, no more. And in Colossians 1.13, he said, Now, brethren, he's delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Well, wait a minute. I thought the kingdom wasn't established yet. Oh, but it is because they're members of it. And in Revelation, John said, I was in the kingdom. Oh, is the kingdom there? Absolutely. He couldn't have been a member of something that wasn't there. Well, the Bible points to the day of Pentecost. The Lord points to the day of Pentecost. And Mark 9, 1 says, Before Pentecost, there's some of you standing here who shall not taste of death until they see the kingdom come with power. On the day of Pentecost, when they were all together, the apostles in one place, Suddenly there came from heaven the sound as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house wherein they were sitting, the apostles. Cloven tongues like as a fire set upon each of them, the apostles. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, the apostles. 
And they, the apostles, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them, the apostles, utterance. And they began to preach. And Peter said, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this same Jesus whom he crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, just go join the church of your choice is all I can tell you. That wasn't what Peter said. He didn't say, now you just pray the little sinner's prayer. You'll be all right. He didn't say that. Why? Because he's under the direction of the Holy Spirit. He's not thinking like men's opinions are. He's thinking like the God of heaven reveals it to him. What did he say? He said, you repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, my friends, that's too simple, isn't it? What church were they a member of when they obeyed the gospel? There wasn't the one, and there's not the one tonight. Amen. And if you would obey the gospel of Christ, the Lord will add you to that church. In Acts 2.41, he says, They that gladly received his word were baptized. And the Lord added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. In verse 47, he said they were praising God. They had favor with all the people. And the Lord added unto the church daily such as were being saved. You know what? He's still adding them. He'll add you tonight. He'll write your name in the book of life in heaven. No, you haven't come to Mount Sinai. That was for the old law. You've come unto Mount Zion. And that's for the new covenant, the new law. That was spoken of in the class before this lesson tonight. <clears throat> covenant means an agreement between two or more parties. And that's what God makes. He makes an agreement with us. He agrees that if we will hear his son, render our obedience to his son in simple trusting faith, that he will save us. Now that's the covenant. But you've got to listen to him. You've got to hear him. And you've got to observe what he is saying. Now, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. You just won't be able to. Tonight, would you hear his word and believe it? Repent of your sins and confess the name of Christ. Be buried with your Lord in the waters of baptism. Everything's in readiness at this building. And we will see you born into the family of God tonight. What a wonderful thing to know that you can go home and pillow your head knowing that your name is in the book of life. When John said, I saw the dead, the great and the small, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things written in the books according to their works. And he said, the sea gave up the dead that was in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And he said, the death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And he said, whose, whose name was not written in the book of life? They were cast into the lake of fire, too. Friend, you don't want to go there. There are no exits there. You cannot get out of once you get there. And you will suffer and suffer and suffer and suffer. Eternity is so long. In fact, it never ends. And Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, they, of the wicked, he said, they shall go away into everlasting or eternal punishment, but the righteous unto eternal life. What makes the difference? Whether or not you come into the plan which God has for your sins to be forgiven, and that's in the church of Christ. Our Lord established that church. Our Lord bought that church with his own blood. And he invites you to be a member. And if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, we want you to consider that seriously and consider your latter end. And then if you have been a Christian, but you've not lived up to the faithfulness of the Lord, you need to come back tonight. And if we may, we'd be happy to pray with you and restore you to the favor of God. Will you come? While together we stand and while we sing.